This is me with Pepper the Robot at the STEM for Girls camp at IBM Think 2023. You see, my friends at IBM and I have the unique opportunity to not only build really fun machine learning techniques, but then we also get to demonstrate it on really cool hardware like Pepper. Now, while we were at Think, the kids absolutely had a blast. They asked Pepper all sorts of creative questions, like, What's the meaning of life? And Pepper was able to hear the question, know what was asked, understand it, generate a response, and even then vocalize it like so. That's a great question. The meaning of life is different for everyone. But for me, it's about learning, growing, and making a positive impact on the world. Oh, that's oh, that's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Now, in my opinion, that experience is just magical, getting to interact with a robot with this custom machine learning pipeline behind it. Now, admittedly, this was a lot more impressive before ChatGPT came out, because ever since then, everybody just seems to think that we're calling ChatGPT in the back end anyway. But really, there is a custom pipeline that goes behind the scenes to make Pepper so natural to interact with. As a matter of fact, there are a couple of key challenges that we face specifically deploying to Pepper. Number one, the experience has to be incredibly natural. That means that we have to be really fast and really accurate, because otherwise we're breaking immersion. If Pepper doesn't understand what you say, or it takes a long time to understand it, it doesn't really feel humanoid, it kind of defeats the purpose of using Pepper to begin with. But additionally, we also have really noisy data to deal with, because Pepper doesn't give us the greatest fidelity of data at times. For example, the fans in Pepper's head uh, can sometimes add a lot of noise to the microphone data that we get. Uh, there are four microphones, and with this extra noise, it can be really difficult to do things like speech recognition. Now, if you take a minute to think about what the architecture behind an application like the one you just saw might look like, you might immediately think of a few different obvious components. One of them is the one that figures out what the user said, obviously speech to text. We also need the actual conversational engine that's able to determine how to respond to the user, and we also need the part of it that's responsible for vocalizing that response, the text-to-speech. Uh, and of all these components, I know it might seem like the one that would be most complex to put together is the one that determines how to actually respond. What is it that we want to say to the user? Because that requires some level of thinking, almost. But with today's language model technology, it's actually not that hard to put together a conversational agent like the one we have on Pepper. Instead, we notice that there is a different challenge that is really hard to solve with Pepper, and that's figuring out what exactly a user said to begin with. Now, I know that speech recognition seems like a task that has been established, and there are pretty standard solutions these days, and so why exactly was it so difficult to implement speech recognition for Pepper? Well, to understand why, let's travel back in time a bit. I've been recording YouTube videos and publishing them to this channel for years now. And a couple of years ago, I got the opportunity to record a short video with my mentor, IBM fellow, John Cohn. Now, this video was recorded at IBM Interconnect uh, 2017, I believe it was. And we were talking about IoT, the Watson TJ bot. Uh, and let's take a listen to a very short clip of that video. I'm John. Um, I've been in IBM 35 years. I'm the chief scientist for the Watson IoT division, and I'm based in Munich and helping bring up our new headquarters there, and we're going to get him here. The reason I wanted you to watch that clip is because I wanted you to notice the audio quality. We recorded that video in a pop-up room at a conference expo, and so there was a little bit of physical isolation between us and the thousands of other people making noise. But I was also using a relatively high quality microphone, and I applied noise cancellation in post. Considering all of that, the audio quality still wasn't great. So you can imagine now extending this to Pepper. Sometimes we will need to demonstrate Pepper in conference expos that have no physical isolation between us and tons of people making noise. As a matter of fact, Pepper's microphones are also lower quality than the ones that I used in this video. Additionally, there's no real-time noise cancellation and there's also fan noise from Pepper's head. And so putting all that into account, we're dealing with some pretty challenging input data in order to do speech recognition from Pepper. Now, still, modern machine learning advances mean that speech recognition on this data actually isn't as difficult as it used to be. OpenAI Whisper, for example, which is one of the best speech recognition models available open source, 
can actually compensate with this kind of noise really well. For example, the clip that you heard of me and John would easily be able to be transcribed by Whisper, and it would even add punctuation and sort of stylization to the text. It's really good at it, and I can also confirm, having used it with Pepper, that it's really good at listening to the data coming from Pepper's mics and telling us exactly what was said by the active voice. Now, despite the fact that Whisper is really accurate if we were to give it audio data that we captured from Pepper, it has one architectural quirk that makes it particularly difficult to deploy in the specific application that we want to build, which is just open-ended, natural conversation. And that architectural quirk is that Whisper is meant to analyze 30 second audio clips at once, using what's known as global attention. So what this means is that when you feed Whisper an audio file, it's actually taking a look at the whole thing and using information from across the clip to transcribe beginning to end. So even when it's writing the very first word that it hears in the audio file, it's actually already quote unquote heard the rest of the audio as well. Intuitively, this can be useful for things like noise cancellation and determining what the active voice is based off of context in the audio clip. But still though, that makes it harder to apply here. Now the way that Whisper works is in contrast to the way that the majority of speech recognition systems work for personal assistants. Most of them do what's known as streaming or causal ASR, automatic speech recognition. Now, when speech recognition is causal or streaming, this means that as new audio data shows up, the model is actively making predictions with just that data. The availability of more data in the future will not change the predictions of the data that was seen in the past. This is not the case for Whisper. And so now we effectively have a model that is really good at telling us what you said if we can somehow figure out when you said it. Because if we can't figure out when you said it, then there's no way for us to clip the audio file. And if we can't clip the audio file, then we don't have something for Whisper to look at. And so it's either we don't know when you started speaking and so we never record and so we never get a transcription, or we just immediately assume that you are speaking when you run the application and then we don't know when you stop speaking and so once again we don't know when to clip and we don't know when to feed into Whisper to get a transcription. Most personal assistants solve problems like this using something like a wake word. So if I said something like, OK Google or Alexa, I'm priming these assistants to begin and to start listening to me. And we actually did something really similar. Hey Pepper, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> me saying hey Pepper there is actually what causes Pepper to start listening and to then transcribe what I say next. The way we did it is by using a custom technique, but not by training any kind of custom machine learning models. And I actually really like that. I mean, even though I love training machine learning models, I actually love this pipeline because we didn't need to train any machine learning models because it's a wonderful example of how a little bit of creativity uh, with how you use existing tools can enable you to do all sorts of things that you wouldn't have thought you could do at first glance as long as you know how the tools actually work. You see, the way that Whisper works is it has an encoder and a decoder. The encoder is the part of the model that's responsible for quote unquote hearing your audio and effectively, well, encoding it into an internal representation that effectively represents what this audio means to the model. The decoder is then responsible for taking the meaning of that audio then from the encoder and turning it into actual words or tokens. The way the decoder works is autoregressive. It's able to take a look at the entire input audio sequence, but at any given step, the only thing that the decoder outputs is the next word that it believes was present in the audio file. In the beginning, it sees no words and outputs a single one. After it outputs a single word, that same word is then fed back into the model for it to predict the next word and so on and so forth. We keep doing this until the model predicts end of sequence. It says, okay, I've seen all these words, I think there's nothing left, and that's where we stop what's called the decoding loop. This decoding loop is what enables us to get the actual transcription of an audio file from Whisper. Now, if you do use Whisper this way, you've effectively implemented speech recognition for your application. However, you can also use the decoder in different ways, and one of the ways that I came up with is one that enables a different use case. Instead of speech recognition, we can do transcript likelihood scoring. Or more specifically, if you're given an audio file and you're given a transcript, what is the likelihood that, that transcript is in fact the correct one for the given audio file? 
And if you can do that transcript likelihood scoring, then suddenly you've basically already implemented wake word detection. Because now all you gotta do is stream in a bunch of audio, and as you get that stream, you continuously check the likelihood of that audio stream's real transcription being something like hey pepper, or whatever else your wake word is. Immediately as you detect a spike, or like a peak, or like you cross a threshold in the probabilities of that transcription that represents your wake word, you know that someone has said the wake word and you can wake up even if that's not necessarily the number one prediction from the model. The way this technique works is by kind of hijacking the decoder of the model. You see, normally at every step, the decoder is not outputting an actual word. Instead, the decoder is outputting the likelihood across its entire vocabulary of any one of those words being the next word. And what we generally do is we choose, for example, the token with the highest probability and feed that token back into the model for it to make the prediction for the next token until it finally predicts end of sequence. At that point, the model is saying, I'm done making a prediction, this sequence is over. However, by hijacking the decoder and instead of choosing its own highest output probability, instead by feeding it the token that I know should come next, uh, specifically from the transcript that I want to score, my candidate transcript, what I can effectively do is force the decoder to output the probabilities over all of these steps of the next token that I know comes next being the correct token. By multiplying these probabilities together, I can get one final score that represents how likely the candidate transcript is to be the correct transcript. For example, if I said, hey pepper, and if I were scoring hey pepper, then at the first step, the word hey would have a high probability. At the next step, the word pepper would have a high probability. And so multiplying them together, I would still get a relatively high probability. However, if I were to say something like, uh, hey tanme, then what's going to happen is at the first step, hey has a high probability. So I'll start with a high probability. But multiplying the probability for pepper after I said tanme will give me a very low value. Multiplying those two together brings the entire score a lot lower. Now if I were to say something like similarly hello pepper, then at first I start with a low value, and so even if the next step for pepper gives us a high value, multiplying them together still gives me a low value. And so effectively, I have turned this into a network that's capable of scoring a candidate transcript rather than necessarily having to generate a transcript from scratch. And so if this all works out, then in theory, we should be good to go and we should have wake word detection. Problem solved. Let's try it out. As you can see, I've got a program here. If I were to go ahead and run this binary, it's going to start listening to me in one second increments and it's going to see um, when I say the wake word. So right now it's in background audio mode, but right as I say, hey Pepper, how are you doing today? As you can see, it worked. It detected the wake word in real time, but it doesn't know when to stop listening. <laughs> That is our next challenge. How does the program know when to stop listening? This is what's known as endpoint detection. Now what's happening is that Pepper doesn't really know when to stop listening, and so we're unable to know when to clip the audio to send it over for a real transcription. We cannot use traditional voice activity detection, which is what most personal assistants do, because they're based off of the human voice's like, frequency range, and because that's what they're based on, it wouldn't work in a noisy environment where the noise is other people's voices, like a conference expo. Instead, we need to do something a little bit more creative. And my solution to this problem was to use speaker embeddings. You see, there are certain kinds of models that are trained specifically to be able to take clips of people speaking and to embed them into a space that represents what the active speaker's voice sounds like. And so effectively what it does is it maps a person's voice into a point in a high dimensional vector space where any points that are closer together in this high dimensional vector space represent that they probably originated from audio clips with the same speaker because of course they sound similar. In a way, you're kind of fingerprinting what someone's voice sounds like mathematically. And you might be able to see where this is going. You see, because of the wake word detection, we have a guaranteed audio clip from the person who is actively speaking to Pepper, actively engaging with Pepper. Specifically, you would have said, hey, Pepper. Because we now have the capability to detect this audio in real time, we immediately know that we have an audio clip with the correct sort of active speaker. So what if we fingerprinted this audio clip? 
And then all we gotta do is look through the audio stream as it continues to come in from Pepper, and immediately as we detect that that fingerprint is no longer present for some period of time, we can assume that, well, whoever was speaking to Pepper has now finished their utterance, and we're good to clip the audio and send it over to Whisper. And that's exactly what we do for Pepper. The core engine of this entire system is written in Rust so that it's performant and runs in real time. It's able to accept audio from any input source, for example, from Pepper or even from my Max microphone so I can test that out right now. As a matter of fact, we're running Whisper and SpeechBrain's speaker embedding models locally. I've compiled them through TorchScript and I'm actually calling them from the Torch C API bindings for Rust. Uh, once that's all in place and once we use all those components to detect the audio clip of you know when someone starts and stops speaking, once we have that clip, it's fed into OpenAI's Whisper API that runs it through a much larger version of the Whisper model to give me the final transcription, uh, making it as accurate as it can be. But enough talking, let's actually take a look at the system in action. So as you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and run the same binary as last time. I've made a couple modifications and recompiled. As you can see, immediately we are in background mode, but theoretically I should be able to say the wake word and an utterance and it should transcribe it. Let's try it out. Hey Pepper, how are you doing today? As you can see, it was able to detect the start, it was able to detect the end point, it was printing out the cosine similarity of the voice, or the distance rather, in real time, and it even gave me the transcript. As a matter of fact, I can continue to speak right now and it's not getting confused. Because it's not detecting the wake word, it's not exiting background mode. So it's not recording any of this and it's not being sent over for real transcription. However, once again, I could immediately in my utterance just go and say something like, hey Pepper, could you tell me what the weather is like like in Germany right now. And just like that, as long as I pause long enough so that my voice is detected as an endpoint, it goes ahead and gives me the transcription of what I say, just like so. Now, in the real world, Pepper wouldn't be able to actually give me the weather in Germany because it's based off of a language model and it's not retrieving that information, but that's something we could always extend it to do in the future. But that's a demo of the core speech engine that goes behind Pepper today. Now, I think this is a really, really creative combination of different machine learning techniques that weren't really even meant to do specifically this, but using them in this sort of architecture uh, enables us to build something really, really cool. And this is why I say code is an art, because while, of course, the implementation of this was certainly not straightforward, and you can take a look at what I mean by that down in the uh, description below, you can take a look at the actual GitHub repo for this, Still, it wasn't the actual implementation that was most difficult. It was just coming up with what to do in the first place. That is the thing that took weeks for us to iterate through and try different designs and try different architectures and techniques. That is what really matters at the end of the day. And so thank you very much for joining today. I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any suggestions or feedback, leave it down in the comment section below or any questions, we're happy to get back to you. Uh, if you do enjoy this kind of content, you wanna see more of it, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel as it really does help out a lot and turn on notifications so you don't miss videos like this one. Once again, thanks for joining. Goodbye.